This conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome everyone uh, to this session of the NWBA webinar series presented by ABC Medical. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Brandon McBain, Director of Membership Services and Programs for the NWBA. I'll be the moderator for tonight's webinar. Um, this is the 12th installment of the webinar series and we hope you find this and all of our future installments to be very informative and useful um, for the remainder of this season and beyond. Um, before we get started, a couple of few housekeeping items. Um, everyone uh, attending the webinar, please ask you to be muted uh, during the presentation so we can focus on the presenters. Um, um, I will be muting individuals if you forget, uh, so I'll be monitoring that. If you do have any questions pertaining to the material, materials being presented, uh, please throw them in the chat function. Um, we also have Q&A at the end, um, but uh, I know our two presenters and myself will definitely be monitoring that and helping address those questions as they come up. Uh, and then if you cannot stay throughout the entire of the presentation, um, this will be recorded and available on the NWBA website tomorrow. Uh, and we'll uh, note that link here later in the presentation. So um, yeah, from that, we'll get started. So before we get started, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the webinar series um, supporter and sponsor, ABC Medical. They're one of the nation's leading medical supply company and serves as a one-stop shop for comprehensive line of medical supplies. The ABC medical team is the first and only provider for urological supplies in the industry committed to adaptive sports. Um, and they continue to make a difference, um, not only um, for our athletes and our communities um, for pro providing these products, but their knowledge around this space. So we just want to say thanks for ABC Medical for their support to the NWBA and the NWBA webinar series. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our two presenters for this evening. Um, so first off is Janie Chaluti. She is our head classifier for the NWBA. She's been a classifier in the medical system. Um, but then also help lead our organization when in 2013-14, we transitioned to the functional classification system. Um, Janie has uh, conducted countless uh, trainings on NWA classification. Uh, she helps train our certified classifiers here for the NWBA. But then in addition to that, she also is a certified international IWF classifier um, most recently, even attending a training over the Thanksgiving Day holiday in Spain. Um, so her commitment um, is so great uh, for our volunteer leadership in this space. So just want to say thank you for Janie for all her commitment in this space. Um, and then our next presenter is Courtney Ryan. Courtney is the athlete representative on the classification committee. Um, in addition to that, uh, Ryan has had a pretty robust playing career and successful at that, uh, playing in NWBA's adult division one and women's division, and most recently competing on the US women's national team that brought home the bronze medal in Tokyo Paralympic. So pretty awesome at that. And Courtney is currently an athlete on the Arizona Storm within the women's division, um, also health coaching uh, the University of Arizona as well, and serves as the vice chair of the women's division, which actually we just announced today, her re-election to that position. So congratulations to that. So without <laughs> further ado, you guys don't need to hear more from me. You can hear from the two great presenters we have on this topic this evening. I will pass it off to them. Thank you. Um, so this came out of a request from Lisa to kind of explain more about the individual classes and how this is working within the junior division. 
So our goals tonight are really that you're going to be able to verbalize what the volume of action is <coughs> and the differences between a J1, a J2, and a J24. You'll be able to understand what the fun, uh, fundamental skills are, be able to verbalize the F, the amputee classification within the junior division, and um, just kind of have a general understanding of upper extremities and how they impact classification. This is how we know if Brandon's paying attention or not. Well done, Brandon, well done. Um, so as she mentioned, we're gonna be talking about volume of action and being able to verbalize the differences between the classes of a J1, J2, and a J4. <clears throat> And just so you know, the definition of a volume of action is the limit to which a player can move his trunk voluntarily in, an, in any direction and with control return to the upright position without holding on to support or to aid the movement. So this is a lot of the things that we're looking at as classifiers when we're evaluating a player is that volume of action and looking at that control a lot of the time and we'll kind of discuss this later on but it includes all directions and describes the, the position of the ball when held with both hands. So is that player able to get back up from that forward position after they've taken a push and their chest is down to their knees? Are they able to get back up into that upright position without any assistance? Or do they have to push off the frame of their chair? Do they have to grab their wheel? Do they have to grab the backrest do they push off their lap there are a lot of different ways that you can kind of look and evaluate volume of action <clears throat> so just to kind of give you a little bit of examples and looking at like i mentioned looking at all the directions and describing the positions of the ball so these are some of the examples or ideas of directions that we're talking about when we are evaluating a player so first one is that vertical plane or that rotation, right? So as you can see on the left hand side, that J1 photo, she has the ball and she's rotating to her left, but there is some kind of resistance a little bit to that rotation and there's not much power. Compared to a J2 and a J24, you can see Mr. David Ng, the famous bald head kind of driving those those elbows over, noticing that that rotation is pretty strong and that he has that full rotation in for that vertical plane. Um, like I mentioned, all directions, next direction is that forward plane. So evaluating a J1, like I mentioned before, that forward plane, when they get into that full push, they're going for that full power push. Are they able to get back up into that upright position without any assistance? Or are they using their frame or their, their hands to get back up into that right position? versus a J2 and a J24, as you can notice in that photo, she has both hands out, she's leaning forward, coming back into that upright position without assistance. So those are major differences as far as that forward plane we're talking about. <clears throat> the last one that we're typically looking at is that lateral plane, looking at side to side rotation or looking at side to side tilts. J1, you're not typically going to be seeing a tilt or a side to side much plane or rotation in that side to side or any rotation. Um, J2, you're going to see a little bit of rotation as far as side to side, but they're going to have to initiate that, right? So you'll see a player pushing, trying to block a, block a shot or a pass, right? They're going to have to push and gain that momentum in order to get that chair or that one side lifted for that side lateral plane versus a J2 or a J4, as you notice in that photo on the right, he is completely leaned over and has both hands above, the, above his head, which typically shows, right, he has that full lateral plane and that full rotation on the side. There's no limitations there. And typically you'll also notice with that, in these sort of situations, players will be able to kind of like Natalie Schneider, who is able to tilt into her chair 
while she shoots without having hands on her wheels or while, without having to initiate or provide movement in order to get that sideways plane. So again, just a quick summary of the volume of actions. Class J1 has no to no partial rotation, right? So that rotation coming from left to right or holding a ball in front of the in front of their chest, um, they do not have that that rotation. Um, also, again, no partial no to partial forward rotation. Um, as far as a class J2, they're going to have that full rotation, full forward rotation, and then no to partial sideways rotation that they're going to have to initiate for that volume of action. Lastly, you have your class J2 or 4, which is full rotation, full forward, and full to one or both sides of that sideways volume of action. All right, thanks, Courtney. So now we're gonna look at what the skills are. So Courtney explained what the volume of action is, how we're looking at how people move. Now we're gonna look at what they're actually doing. So in terms of the fundamental skills that we're looking at, it's propulsion, pushing, catching, passing, dribbling, rebounding, response to contact, because we all realize that basketball is a contact sport, and shooting. So what we have, um, is just little figures of um, a basketball player in do, do, doing some of these things. So Brandon, so a class J1. Class J1, as Courtney explained, is gonna be more like a uh, adult division one or two. So if you look at the first picture, the little dotted line is they're gonna immediately bring their hands down. J1, tries to shoot the ball with both hands. They're gonna bring their hands right back down or they're gonna be holding on to their chair with one hand as they try and shoot with the other hand. Okay, Brandon. Um, a J1 that starts to have some partial forward motion their upper body may be able to go forward as they shoot, but their lower trunk is going to be against the backrest. That's one of the ways to really know a difference between a J1 and a J2 is looking at that lower trunk. If the lower trunk is staying stabilized when they need to shoot, then they're a J1. If they're able to take their lower trunk off the backrest, then they're going to be probably a J2. The other thing you'll start to see is a J1 will be able to have their low back on the backrest, but do that partial rotation that Courtney talked about, rotating from the waist towards the basket. But the rotation is only from their waist, not their hip. Brandon. So here are our J2s. Now you can see in the first picture, the low back no longer needs to be stabilized. They're able to lean forward off the backrest with their complete back and shoot. And also, if they need to rotate to the basket, it's their full trunk rotating. The other thing is, in the J2s, it's a solid line for the trunk. They have a solid trunk. I kind of always think of the J1s as like a hula. Their upper trunk and their lower trunk don't always work together. Brandon? Our J2-4s are able to lean way forward as they're shooting and they're moving forward. or they're able to lean out to at least one side, rotate and shoot, or they're able to stay out to one side and shoot. So this is what Courtney was explaining in that other picture where the J24 player was well beyond his base of support, well out to the side, holding the ball and being able to shoot with both hands and return to upright, as she explained. Next, Brandon. So with passing, 
Your J1s, as Courtney explained, did not have good forward movement. They either have no forward or only partial forward. So if they're trying to pass the ball in front, they're going to lose their balance. So they're going to hold on with one hand, or if they try to pass with two hands, they need to counterbalance by bringing their shoulders and their head back. Or if they go all the way forward onto their lap and shoot with two hands, that's it. They're down there. They need to use their hands to come back um, to upright. Brandon? So the J1s the, um, that start to have some trunk function, again, we talked about their low back stays stabilized against the chair. It's that every action has a reaction. So their low back is against the back of the chair as their upper trunk is able to move forward. Often you'll see the J1 starting to cross body pass. They hold on with one hand, the ball's in the other hand, and they rotate across their body because that's one of their strongest movements. So they, from their waist, they um, throw across their chest to pass. So a J2, you now have that nice state, uh, straight trunk, stable trunk. They can do a very strong two-handed pass. They come way off their backrest and they can push. They don't need to counterbalance. They can also do that javelin throw, holding on with one hand and throwing the ball straight forward. They don't need to use the rotation to help stabilize. Our J2 fours, or J24 can come out to the side and pass at least one side. And as in the pictures Courtney explained, it's well beyond their base of support they're coming out. They can lean out to the side and rotate, or they could just lean out to the side and do a two-handed pass and return to upright. So catching. Our J1s you know, you need to throw them the ball right in the middle, right in the middle of their chest. If they're going to try and catch a ball with one hand, they have to hold on to the chair. And often they're bringing their off hand over to the other side of the, the chair to catch the ball because they need to help prevent that rotation and that impact of the ball with them losing their balance. A J1 can help initiate with catching a ball in front with two hands, and they can start to catch a ball with their low back stabilized, rotating from their waist. But if you notice, the head is still forward. You don't have all that side rotation yet. A J2 is able to fully rotate their trunk to catch the ball that's coming from the side, and they're able to lean to one side to catch a ball, but they're still holding on. And you can see that there's instability if they need to go outside their base of support. So often you'll see um, a J2, their head is going to come back over their base of support if their arm has to get, go out to the side to have that counterbalance to keep them from losing stability off to the side. A J24 may need to hold on to one with one hand to go to one side or may have loss of balance if they need to go um, laterally onto one side but not the other side so a j24 always will have at least one good side where they're able to fully go out and fully come back So rebounding, your J1s are going to be holding on. If your J1 tries to do a rebound with two hands, the ball is going to come back down into their lap right away. They're going to have some instability. Um, their low back is going to need to be stabilized. Um, your J2s are going to be able to come off the backrest. So as we talked about, but if they need to get a ball that's out to the side a little bit, they're going to hold on with one hand. They're not going to be able to reach beyond their base of support, um, but they are very strong with two-handed rebounds over their head. And that's a big distinction between a J1 and a J2 is the stability, um, two-hand rebounds overhead. 
a J24 can come way out to the side to get a rebound. They can rotate while they're getting a rebound. They can use both hands and be stable. And as Courtney talked, that you know they can tilt their chair up to get a rebound because their chunk in their pelvis is strong. So pushing, propulsion, your J1s um, are going to use their head to counterbalance and to initiate their push. Now, sometimes people question when they see a J1, but they're all the way down on their lap when they're pushing, but they can't do anything when they're down there. So if someone leans all the way forward onto their lap, it doesn't mean they're a J2, but you have to look at, remember, volume of action is how to come back to your starting position. So if someone goes all the way down without control and pushes, and then they need to use both arms to push themselves back up, you're still in that J1 category. So where some uh, a J1, we said, can have partial control on that forward plane. So a J1 may be pushing with their low back stabilized, but you see that upper trunk coming forward, getting their power from that upper trunk. Some J1s may be able to get, go down onto to their lap with control, hold their head up, and when they need to push up, they may only need one hand to come up. Um, but they're going to lead with their head and their shoulder to come back up, and they're going to get that little wave in their back. It's not going to be their straight back coming up. Now, just because you use your hands to bring yourself back up does not mean you're a J1. J2, J24s can use their arms to come back up. Um, and as the game goes on, you may notice they do that more because they're a little more tired. But um, a J1 needs their arms to come back up. Okay, Brandon? A J2 is going to have a straight trunk. They're going to be able to come all the way forward. You're going to see them rocking more, leaning forward when they push and being able to come back up again in order to see that power being generated through that forward movement. And a J24 is able to push really hard. They're able to stop really hard. In terms of the actual push, you're not going to see a big difference between a J2 and a J24. The braking, you may see a difference in being able to stop hard, but the push, because they have a normal trunk, both of them are going to be able to use their trunk to generate power. The J1 with braking and pivoting. So what you see here is if they want to break, they need to push all the way back. They need counterbalance. They need to use their body so it doesn't fall forward. This is sometimes when you may see some people landing on their laps and using their arms to come up because they don't have the trunk strength to maintain that upright position. The other thing is when they need to pivot, if um, the direction of the pivot, you're going to see the J1s lean in the other direction because they need to counterbalance that pivot. If they really leaned into a pivot, they don't have the strength to pull themselves back up. Or you may see them hooking on to the, the wheelchair to help stabilize so that they don't fall over into the pivot. Um, now some, Brandon, some J1s may start to lean into a pivot, but only their upper trunk is leaning. Their low back is still stable against the backrest, and they may tilt their shoulders in the direction of the pivot, but it's not their whole trunk leaning into it. Um, again, with braking, a J1 uh, is going to have that low back stabilized. They can also use their arms on the wheels to help prevent them from moving forward, but they're not taking their arms off the wheels or off the chair until they're completely stopped. A J2, they're able to fully lean into a pivot. They get power out of their trunk when they're leaning into a pivot. They want that momentum to help them um, pivot faster. Uh, a J2 with braking will be able to stop and maintain an upright trunk when they're stopped, and they can um, not have to completely come to a full stop before initiating a movement. 
our J2 fours are able to lean fully in either direction. They often have their arm out so that they can again get generate more momentum to make a faster pivot. Dribbling. So um, a J1 will frequently be dribbling right by the their hips, kind of right at the hub of the wheel. And the reason is this is where they have control. Their hand is going to be above the ball. They're going to be able to push right down and have the ball come right back up because they don't have that movement or that rotation to chase after a ball. Now, we did talk about the fact that J1s may be per, uh, pushing their chair, leaning all the way forward. But if they're trying to dribble chair and they're all the way forward, it's one hand on the chair and it's not very stable. But again, their hand is directly above the ball. So the ball is going right down and right up. It's not behind the ball. They're not pushing the ball forward because they're not able to get the ball if it's forward. Um, you'll see some J1s that have more trunk function. Their low back, again, is going to be stabilized against the, the backrest. They may be able to start leaning more forward, up more towards their caster. But if they start getting up towards the feet or the front of their chair, you're going to see some arching in their back to maintain some stability. A J2 is able to dribble all the way out in front, well beyond their feet, and their hand's going to slip down behind the ball a little bit so they can push it forward because they're able to lean out in that forward plane to get the ball. A J2-4 can fully dribble way out to the side on one side, and they're pushing the ball forward when they're dribbling in front. With contact, your J1s don't like contact. Um, so your J1s are going to lose stability with um, anterior contact, posterior contact, or lateral contact. They're going to need their hands to stabilize. A J2 um, will lose their balance if they get contact from the side, but they will be able to maintain contact from the front because they have a stronger trunk. A J2-4 is able to take contact from at least one side laterally, and that's hard contact. So they're not going to lose their balance. They may lose it on the weaker side, but um, they have at least one side which is able to take lateral contact. So your chair set up, your J1s are going to have some dump in their chair typically. The junior division is a little harder, and we all know that you know we're playing with program chairs, and sometimes the kid is just in the chair that fits their hips. Um, but typically for a J1, you're going to want some dump in the chair. You're going to want the knees significantly higher than the hips to help provide that um, stability and help decrease the effect of gravity. They're going to be strapped for um, their lower trunk to help maintain it in the chair. Their legs are going to be strapped. A J2 does not need that trunk strapping. Their legs may be strapped. Sometimes their feet are strapped. But um, a J2 is where you're going to start seeing people being able to sit on a straighter seat. Just because someone has a little bit of dump does not mean they're automatically a J1. That could just be a preference. Um, but a J2 will be able to sit on a strong seat. But again, in the juniors, be careful. You're just not looking at the chair set up and assuming that's their class because they may just be in a program chair. A J24 can sometimes have the back of their chair higher than their hips now because that puts them more in that runner's stance because they have the hip control, they have some of that um, leg control now that you put the hips a little bit higher, they're able to use their legs a little bit more. Awesome, thanks Jamie. 
Um, so just to continue on with the conversation, um, a class J2 compared to a class J2-4. So obviously J2 is the same as the adult division, um, which would be a 3.0. A J2-4 is the same as an adult of 4.0 to 4.5. So as you can see in this, um, this drawing, the difference is J24 has that full volume of action to at least one side. They bring the ball out towards the right of their, like in the diagram, out to the right. They have that full volume of action, that full rotation. But as they get to the left side, you can see where that rotation is a little bit limited. And if you're looking at the difference between a J24, this is a great visual to be able to use to kind of uh, look kind of evaluate that rotational difference for that full volume of action. Um, so in this photo, they're all players that are J24. You can see that they have either partial or no, um, or partial or full rotation in that side plane. So they're both, all three of them really, are leaning in, tilting that chair without having any sort of resistance, leaning in while they're trying to block that shot or take that shot vice versa in that tilt game. So good representation in this photo of a J24 specifically for that side, um, for that side rotation. And typically, J2 player will lose balance with lateral contact, and we'll have some pretty good examples for y'all later on in this presentation to kind of showcase what we mean by that. But typically, somebody's going in for a layup, they get hit on the side and get nicked a little bit to to kind of get that foul called, and you'll see in a J2 kind of them lose their balance and fall kind of laterally to the side because of that contact versus J24 will remain stable with that lateral contact on at least one side. <clears throat> um, again, just looking at those differences and comparing, comparing, comparing these photos, um, a class J2 can lean into that sideways plane, but not fully. You can kind of see the difference between the class J2 on the left side versus the one on the right. He has that full volume of action um, on one side with that and full rotation on that one side and is able to kind of lean into his shot without any sort of balance issues. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about amputees. Um, so amputees are grouped uh, by definition of their amputation, and that's kind of where we start. And these definitions are based on the residual limb length. Um, the residual limb length helps tell us kind of what muscles they should have in order to help them with their side to side or their forward movement. The definitions are used as a guide, and classification is always based on observation, not definition, but it gives you a starting point when you're looking at the amputees. So when we're talking about amputees, we're talking about how long their limb is. So what we're looking at is the bony difference. So when we say two thirds or we say less than two thirds, we need to know what that is. So this just kind of tells you how you're measuring the length of the limb. And we kind of go from where the leg bone connects to the hip bone and all the way out to the front of the knee. And then you compare it to the residual limb where it's that same leg bone, but it's to the end of the bone, not to the end of the limb. So you really have to feel to know where the end of the bone is. And we always measure in centimeters. So um, not everyone has the opposite leg or a knee. So if you're dealing with someone with a bilateral above knee amputation, you're gonna be measuring from the back of their elbow to the end of their long finger. And that should be the same length as their femur would have been.
So we consider a long limb greater than two thirds and we consider a short limb less than two thirds. The reason for that is the short limb does not provide you adequate leverage or the muscle insertions in order to be able to lean side to side. Another big thing we talk about is the difference between a hip disarticulation and a hemipelvectomy. The reason this is important is your hip disarticulations are always going to be a J24, not always, your hip disarticulations start out as a J24, but your hemipelvectomies start out as a J2. And when you look at the, the player, you're not really going to know just by looking. You're either going to need to talk to them, you're going to need an x-ray, or you're going to need the, the classifier, the team reviewer is going to have to be able to palpate to try and feel, is there two um, hip bones or just one? So th these are some drawings, and Brandon put them in the NWBA webpage under junior classification, so you have it. And um, so after this many years, I've kind of figured it out, but um, I tell all the classifiers, keep this with them um, because it really helps you when you're looking and you don't have to strain your head to think about what it is. You have the paper to help you. So and when we're looking at the single leg amputee, the reason the J24 is, um, is because you have that one foot to help you in that forward plane. Um, if the J2 is someone with a hemipelvectomy. So that's one of the reasons we need to know what the difference is. So all below knee amputations, whether stabilized or not, will be a J24. Bilateral above knee amputations. So what we're looking at is if someone, both of their limbs, the residual limbs are greater than two thirds, they're gonna be a J24. Once that limb is less than two thirds, they're gonna be a J2. So if it's, and that's why we need to, to measure um, the, the length of the limbs. If both limbs are less than two thirds, they're gonna be a J2. So if both limbs are less than one third, they actually may be less than a J2. And this is where you need to use your observation. If both limbs are less than one third, they really don't have the stability in the forward plane and they don't have the muscle insertion for the stability in either lateral plane. So these players may end up being less than a J2. Someone with a hemipelvectomy and an above knee amputation, less than two thirds, again, may be less than a J2. And someone with a bilateral hip disarticulation, again, may be less than a J2. Um, so a bilateral below knee and upper knee, or above knee, sorry. So um, a J24, bilateral, um, a J24 with a below knee and an above knee greater than two thirds is a J24. A below knee and an above knee less than two thirds is a J24. A below knee with a hemipelvectomy is a J2. So this is the same as if, because they're stabilized on that leg, this is the same as if they had um, a single leg amputee. All right, so now the below knee is not stabilized. So this does change when they're above knee less than two thirds, um, they become a J2. So that's why it's important to know kind of where we're at. And the hemipelvectomy with a below knee not stabilized remains a J2. A 
Okay, upper extremities. So we're not gonna go into this in big detail, but we're gonna try and give you just a little way to think about it. So when we're looking at upper extremities, we always classify the trunk and the lower extremity first, and then look at the impact of the impairment in the upper extremity. Does it really impact? Um, and you need to look at what it does both offensively, defensively, what it does in a one-to-one -one situation. So the player's upper extremity limb impairment may not even change their classification. Um, just because you have an upper limb impairment and you're a J2 or J24 does not make the player a J1. Um, and the amount of deduction may not even change their classification. If it's someone that has an upper extremity impairment, but they're able to have full volume of action on both sides, um, and you want to take some off for their upper extremity impairment, they still may be a J24, because even if you took theoretically like half a point off, that would only make them a four, which is a J24. The whole point is that no player is advantaged or disadvantaged by the classification of a player with an upper extremity impairment. Um, and we really need to make sure because the players that are in that class have no opportunity to do something different. So you have to make sure you don't um, over benefit the person with the upper extremity impairment. So CP, um, CP affects people in many different ways, spasticity, felicity, or athetoid movements. And all of this needs to be, be considered when we're looking at them. Not all players with CP are gonna be a J1. So each has a different impact on function, coordination, speed, um, hand-eye coordination, and the impact of when you're actually playing a game and the speed and the excitement of being in a game can change all of that for a player with CP. So remember the foundation is based on observation during competition. Um, so in, in addition to the fundamental skills we looked at, we need to consider for people with CP so some additional considerations. So the speed of the movement. You can pass a ball on the sideline, they can pick up a ball on the sideline, but once they get in the speed of the game, and they get that pass and that excitement, what, are they able to control that? Are they able to maintain their trunk mobility during effort? Are they able to disassociate trunk movements or disassociate upper extremity movements? The ability to achieve and maintain elbow and wrist extension at the same time while shooting, catching, dribbling, and uh, propulsion. Can they keep their knees apart when leaning sit sideways? Um, maybe on the side court when you ask them to do stuff they can, but in the excitement and in the speed of the game and in the force they're trying to generate, their knees can come together when they move sit sideways that eliminates their ability to return to an upright position, um, to transition from one side to the other, to transition from the right to the left. How fast can they do that and to coordinate their movements when they're trying to do stuff? If you're not able to use your offhand because of something you're doing with the ball, that that needs to be considered both offensively and defensively. So, so we're going to look at some videos. Um, so I hope you can see them okay. The and we're going to look at every class. I'll try and talk a little bit. Um, and if you have questions, please let us know so we can refer to the video while we have it going. So the, the J1 videos we picked are people that are really at the higher end of that classification. But if you watch Becca, her low back is not leaving the backrest of the chair. Her trunk's coming forward, but her low back stays stabilized. When she went to get that ball, she really had to pull back with her head and shoulders to return to upright. Again, when she's put, put pushing the ball, she's pushing it so it comes back to her not able to catch it out in front. Her rotation there is from her waist, not her pelvis.
Again, really looking at her low back is remaining stabilized on the backrest. That's a J1 player. Her rotation is from her waist. She's not able to rotate from her pelvis. Again, you're looking at a J1 player. So when she shoots, you'll see her low back pushes back against the backrest, and it's really only her upper trunk that's moving, and she doesn't move forward into her shot because she doesn't have the strength in that forward plane. Contact, and she lost some stability. So is everyone pretty comfortable looking at um, as a J1? Or does anyone see some J2 characteristics? Okay, so you see that loss of stability. You see the low back against the backrest. Her upper back and her lower back do not function as one unit. You see the instability when she's moving. All right, Brandon, you want to go to the next one? So this is another example of a J1 player that comes forward well onto his legs, but in order to get up, back to upright, he needs to use his arm and he leads coming back up with his head and his shoulders. His trunk is not straight and you see the instability between the upper trunk and the lower trunk. When he wanted to do that pass, he one hand was on the, the wheelchair. So there you see the upper trunk and the lower trunk um, not working together. His upper trunk went to his right, his lower trunk went to his left. So that shows that disassociation between the upper and lower trunk. He didn't have any forward movement on his shot, and you saw a loss of stability when he did shoot. All right, we're good, Brandon. Want to go to the next ones?
So look at Will's trunk, straight up and down all the time. He just reached for the ball, his trunk stayed straight. You didn't see a difference between the upper and lower trunk that you saw with Opie or you saw with um, Becca. You could really see that strong trunk. He was off the backrest, his hands were over his head, but he wasn't able to lean to the side to defend the ball there. Okay, nice straight trunk, no loss of stability. And that's what he's trying to reach for a ball. He's trying to pull the chair up to tilt. That's kind of what Courtney was talking about in the beginning. Your J2s don't have a lot of strength to do that. They have to use their offhand to pull the chair up, but he, whoop, and there's the loss of stability with lateral contact. There he was able to rotate a little bit to reach back, but not fully. So your J2s, what you're gonna see is that straight trunk, that up and down stability in the trunk that you didn't have with your J1s. And as Courtney pointed out, the difference between your J2 and your J1s is that forward movement. So he had anterior contact there and he didn't lose his balance. He was able to stay upright. Anterior contact, no loss of stability. All right, Brandon, you want to go to the next one? So the, the solid trunk, the rotation from the pelvis, the holding on in order to reach laterally. So they're the things we're going to be looking at for our J2s. J2 has good contact anterior, but not lateral. So if you see somebody who gets lateral um, contact and loss of balance, um, you're going to want to make sure you see it on both sides. All right, Brandon, you want to go to the next one? <clears throat> So what you're looking for here to see a J24 is that going out to one side. Uh, loss of stability on one side with contact, but being able to lean laterally to at least one side.
so again, looking more at J24s, um, examples, as you can see, that first push she had, she had that full forward rotation and was remained. And after that little contact, that which they will show again, is able to, that contact there, she's able to remain stable with that lateral contact without kind of falling over side to side. So again, full forward rotation in her push. Um, <clears throat> so this is this little tidbit. These these uh, videos are really great examples of seeing that contact on that lateral side and seeing the difference between a J2 and a J24 and how they kind of take on that contact. You can tell that she's definitely using that rotation in her pelvis and her hips and her that it's fluid motion as she continues to push more contact in the shot. That's a funny clip because she tried to pass it to her teammate and ended up getting hit in the head. So again, she's pushing and going all the way down to the point where her chest is touching her knees and is able to maintain that full position, upright position at the end of her push to get back up with it without any sort of assistance. So big difference there. And you can go ahead to the next slide, Brandon. Okay, so let's talk about Mikey. One of my favorite players ever. Mikey yeah. is a two. Um, and he has a pretty significant upper extremity impairment. Um, so what we're looking for is does that impairment, is that significant enough to make his play equal to that of a J1? So we can see his trunk is strong. Um, we can see he's able to take contact. He's able to take a, a little bit on the side, you see. Now this is why he had some difficulty with his left arm being able to maintain that ball. But he was able to come back up from about a caster level without using his arm there. The upper extremity impairment in the left side made it difficult for him to catch the ball on the left or to be able to dribble the ball on the left. But is that significant enough to make him down to a J1? And the answer is no. Um, he is much too strong in his trunk and on his right side uh, to be, uh, to have parity with a J1 player. So even though he has an upper extremity, even though we see that his upper extremity impairment limits his ability to catch the ball on his left, to dribble the ball on the left, he loses the ball with contact there. Um, he has to play around it. When someone starts to come on to, to his right side, he can't switch the ball to his left side. Um, if he was a J24 player, that might be enough to make him a J2, but it's not significant enough as a J2 to make him a J1. Does anyone have any questions about that rationale? And you can see how sh shooting, how that left arm impairs, but he's still much more stable and he's able to get more force on his shot than a J one player could. If we think about Opie and Becca, how they did their free throws, um, Mikey is much stronger. It's not whether they make the basket, but it's the volume of action th that they have while completing the skill. All right, no questions. Brandon, you want to go to the next one? So this guy here, watch his hands. He's got significant 
deformities in both hands. He's a J24, he's a bilateral amputee. He plays with his prosthesis on. But the way his fingers are, he's still able to grasp the wheel. He's still able to catch and hold a ball. He's still able to lean out to that side with one hand. He got the ball and brought it back to the middle. So even though he has a significant impairment in his hands, he still remains a J24. He is too strong um, to be considered a J2. If you just looked at his hands, you'd say, oh my gosh, he has to be a J1. But if you watch, he's able to hold the ball with one hand, he's able to push, he's able to hold the wheel, he's able to keep his position against an offense and defense. Okay, Brandon. All right, so Courtney and I tried hard to keep us on time. Here are the resources um, that we use to, that Courtney and I used to make the presentation, but we also added the amputee tables to the website under junior classification. We added the typical functions and there's a quick reference guide, which just kind of looks at um, what the volume of action divided by the junior classifications. So does anyone have any questions? We've must have explained it that well that there are no questions, I'm assuming. <laughs> All right, Brandon. Well, I was expecting, Dave, I, I thought you were always good for a good one. Uh, but uh, if you guys have any questions, I know you can send them over to myself or Janie or Courtney, um, we can make sure we get the answers for you. Um, and, you know, this recording will be back up uh, online tomorrow if you need to rewatch an explanation that Courtney or Janie went over any of the topics and the resource uh, materials are up. Oh, Dave does have one. All right. I, I was expecting Dave to have one. Fire away, Dave. Today's question is, what does a team do if they're unsure about a player? Um, so the team reviewer's role is to, on that team, is to propose a class. And then you go to your next game's team reviewers from the other teams, then look at your player, and they either agree with that class or they propose a different one. Um, so that's our way to try and help make sure that the players are put in the right classification. Um, if you're stuck, you can always ask another team reviewer to, to, to look at them and come up with, you know, what you both think they are. There's a couple conferences, adult conferences, that do a conference tournament in the beginning of the season and the team reviewers are all there and they actually go around almost like a classification panel looking at all the players to um, get everything done in the beginning of the season. So the team reviewers can also work together when they're at a tournament to try and come up with what class you want the player as. Does that answer your question? Um, all right, so Dave's question is, if the reviewers don't agree, how can a team ask to have things solved by someone more knowledgeable and experienced? The, um, the team reviewer for your team makes a proposed. Two other team reviewers sign off. Whatever the consensus is of the three is the player's classification. Um, if a player wants 
to ask for that classification to be reviewed. That's something we'd have to work out with um, the classification committee on how to have a panel observe a player. Uh, Gabriella is asking, what if someone's classified wrong, but the mistake is not caught until they compete? Does that happen often? Um, so it only happens often if you're classified too high. No one ever thinks that they're classified too low. So that's why we have that um, proposed and approved. So if you're proposed a J2 and you get to a, a, a game or a tournament and the other team reviewers think you're really a J1, that's their responsibility to then sign off that they're a J1. And again, the consensus rules. So the consensus of three team reviewers is what the player's classification is. There is not a system in place in the junior division really to um, have classifiers of available at tournaments. Just to add to Janie's uh, comment, um, it's very critical that, you know, team reviewers and team reps, you are getting those classifications and classification forms completed upon first competition. So you're not waiting till the eighth, ninth, tenth game in the season. Um, so that mistake, or that classification is addre being addressed late into the season. Um, I know that this system continues to be one that's, uh, you know, fine-tuned, uh, but at the same time, that first competition that you're going to, you should have that classification form available for that other team, and they should have a team reviewer present or someone that's certified as a team reviewer signing off on those classifications. So. Um, just a different way to address the question that hopefully we're addressing it early in the season and not uh, later um, when multiple games have been played. Darlene, that's a great question. Is there a way to protest a class? Um, there is not in the junior division, and that's something the division needs to work with the classification committee to develop. So with classification, not just for juniors, but for adults as well, um, it is a very dynamic process and it is not a perfect process. So um, we do look at kind of the things that happened last season and what can we do to try and make it better in this coming season. So we don't repeat our mistakes and we try and learn from them. Some of it is just process, and some of it's just educating people as to what the process is so that um, it works for everybody. Any other, Any other questions? questions? And I'll just jump in. I know that I have conversations with a lot of team reps and people that email and call me. I know classification can be an intimidating space. Um, not everyone has the knowledge that Janie or um, uh, Court or others have. Um, and so it's just critical that if you have questions, ask them. It's no, no questions, you know, a dumb question or if you need help, uh, I think the important thing is, um, especially in the junior division, your team should have multiple individuals educated in this space. You know, each team is required to have one team reviewer, but frankly, there's nothing that said that you couldn't have all of your coaching staff be team reviewers and educated on this. Um, so if someone's missing from a game, or if you guys want to bounce ideas off classifications of your own players or signing off from the opposing teams, um, you know, I think the more the minds, the merrier in this. Uh, we understand a lot of you guys are 
dipping your toe for the first time in classification and maybe haven't been around um, maybe in the adult functional system. So. Awesome. Well, definitely getting some thank yous, Courtney and uh, Janie in the chat box there. Uh, we want to thank all of you for attending. I know, um, you know, these, uh, these recordings are available at a later time, but nothing like being in person and live. So I know speaking on behalf of Courtney and Janie, hopefully you took some value from the conversation and discussion today. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Um, reference the materials that are available online, um, rewatch this recording, um, but we're here to hopefully educate you more in this space and get some comfortability around this. So thank you everyone uh, and have a great rest of your evening.